So thank you everybody um, for joining our webinar today with uh, three community leaders. Uh, it's uh, good to see the people I can see and um, I've had the great benefit of being able to look at the list of the people that are on this call, uh, 123 of us, um, so many names I know, um, so many people that I know are leaders in our community and investors in change. So um, we look forward to having you here for this important conversation about the opening of schools and uh, many of the aspects related to that. So um, we're going to get underway um, and I'm sure other people will be joining in as, as we go. So I'd say the goal of this is twofold. One is to explore this issue in greater detail. Um, what uh, what is the interaction between opening the schools and important issues of mental health? Uh, and, and how do our partners in the schools and partners in the community think about that? And then I, I'd like to frame this also in terms of one of my goals for this. Uh, I would say uh, at the other part of my life as a foundation executive, we have investments and there are like a plethora of webinars to give investment advice to, to help us navigate the, the new world ahead. And I, I hope the information we give uh, our folks today gives you all investment advice in terms of how you look at how you put your time and treasure and, and compassion into the community. And hopefully this will help frame some of your investments going forward. So the process today is, is pretty simple. Um, we have three great speakers who I will introduce uh, and I'll introduce them um, right before their time to speak. Um, each of them has about, checking my script here, about four minutes, eight minutes, I'm sorry, just to give a general presentation. And then about halfway, about 10.30 or so, uh, we will shift over and go into q and A. I I have uh, a few questions myself that I, I get to ask. But also there is a Q&A bar on your screen. So if you want to send in questions along the way, please feel free to do so and we'll take those as we can. Um, and then we'll close at 11. So uh, let me also say, uh, I, I've had a chance to see a little bit of what, what the presenters are gonna offer. And I just wanna tee up three themes for all of our listeners, uh, just so you have a chance to listen for those none of which will be a surprise. So theme number one is that no one really knows what the answer is. <laughs> that things are very fluid. Um, people are doing their best to chart, uh, chart new waters uh, and, and uh, not that they're making things up as they're going along, but, but final decisions haven't been made. I would say the second theme that's important is, is this is showing how many things intersect at this important opening of school. So you have uh, issues of, of academics, you have issues of mental health, you have a connection between social justice and racial inequity, and they all are coming together at this particular point in time as we look to open the schools. And then uh, I think the third thing, and it's really obvious, is how much leadership matters. I mean, we know that's always the case, but particularly in this time of uncertainty, uh, leadership is critical, and I think for the 120 of us that are not our primary speakers, we are grateful for the three of you who are. Um, you are the right people in the right place at the right time. And I think we are, we are lucky, very lucky to have you. So I'm, uh, we're gonna just slide things over to our first speaker, Susan Salcedo. Um, she is uh, the superintendent of county schools and has been there for since 2017. Uh, she grew up in Santa Maria taught at, let's see, is the list, Dos Pueblos, San Marcos. Uh, Susan was the principal of Santa Barbara Junior High when one of my kids was there. I can't remember which one. Uh, <laughs> we were sorry to see you go, uh, but then you moved on into your great position uh, at, at Santa Barbara County Office of Schools. Um, Susan is gonna bring us a, a unique uh, per point of view in between what's happening on the state level in terms of overall guidance towards opening and what's happening in our local district. I think she has an important nexus to that. Uh, Susan uh, is, is married to a high school teacher. She has two kids and two dogs. So just to liven this up just a little bit, she has actually told us what kind of dogs they are. So for those of you that are 
listening, if you hear her presentation and from just the way she presents, you can predict the breed, you go ahead and send that to me on the Q&A with your name. And if you're the first one to do it, you win a prize from Kong. So let's see if people can really, you know, impute the breed from the personality. So a couple things, it has to be right after her presentation. And if you live across the street from Susan, you are not eligible. So it really has to come from the presentation. So with that, I'll, I will turn things over to uh, Dr. Salcedo. Thank you so much. Wow, prizes for most unique introduction. I'm still giggling and, um, and thank you for the warm introduction too. And I really appreciate being um, here with everyone, with the panelists, Elena and Fran and John again, thanks. And hi to everyone. I'm really excited to, to be here and to be able to uh, share with you. So as John, I'll dive right in. And so as John said, I, I'd really like to paint the picture for what reopening of schools will look like in the fall. And it's going to be such a quick snapshot. Of course, put some questions in the, in the chat if you, if you have any. But I um, wanted to say that as we look at the reopening of schools in the fall for Santa Barbara County, all of the schools, there's over 125 schools in Santa Barbara County and throughout the state, I think the big message is it is going to look differently across the entire state and county. It's really, really important to know that when school opens and how it looks will be very, very different depending on each district. So that's the broad, but let me tell you a little bit about why. So, um, and, and let me tell you about a couple of the models first. One of the models you'll see in some of our schools in, in this county and across the state will be that every day, all student, students will be back every day on campus as if it were pre-pandemic. That'll be a model for some of our schools. And in most of our schools, I think you'll find a hybrid model where, um, and I'm gonna say the hybrid model has multiple models, but in many cases it will be split into half. So half the students will be on campus for portions of the week, and then the other half will be home distance learning and switch. So let me say about why. The reason for all of this really has to do obviously with health and safety. So by obviously, I mean, we're all handling the, the changes because of that, but really the leading factor for schools and the models have to do with the governor's orders with the public health officers in each county. So there's 58 counties in California, 58 different public health officers. You hear often from Dr. Henning Anzorg, who's our public health officer in Santa Barbara County. And our orders here say that schools can reopen in Santa Barbara County as long as they have six feet of social distancing. So whenever you have six feet, typically what it means is spacing out, you're gonna have fewer students in a class and um, you literally, administrators, principals, teachers have been measuring in their classrooms to see how many students they can get into a class. So with that, because of the size of the facilities the number of students in each class, the numbers of faculty and staff, those all mix into why some, student, some schools will be able to open fully and why some schools will be open um, in a hybrid model. And um, all of that uh, really still, once a model has been created, has to everyone, district by district, there are 20 school districts in Santa Barbara County from Cuyama to Guadalupe, Lompoc, Carpinteria, Santa Barbara, every school district has their own labor negotiations um, with their labor partners. So um, all of the models still have to be approved by labor and their school boards. So that, those are some of the factors as to why you're not necessarily hearing the here is exactly what it's going to look like. What you're probably hearing and what you're definitely hearing are here's what it could look like. We think this will look this way. We believe we're going to open this way and this is what the models um, appear to be. So those are some of the, the whys behind um, the, the what the models will look like. And I think what I want to do next is to um, share some of the big impacts of this. So what, what's happening as a result of this? And again, this isn't all, but just a few. One of the big results or outcomes that I think we all are thinking about are childcare and supervision needs. So when, um, so anyone who has a child in a school age child or anyone who's an employer of a parent or guardian with a school age child will be aff affected or impacted because um, in many cases, and the hybrid models can look differently. So some of the hybrid models will have, for example, 
students going two days a week and then the other times will be home. In other hybrid models that are looked at in Santa Barbara County, you might have half of the student body going for a full week and the next week they won't go. So in any of those models, families are going to be thinking about childcare and supervision. And so that's one big area that we're all thinking about. I know the community is thinking about as well. I wanted to raise and, and acknowledge that that is something that's gonna be significantly different. The other piece that I wanna raise is really looking through, and this is what we're doing in schools, looking through schools through this absolute equity lens. And, and I think that's so important um, that we look through all of this, not just as logistical, but what is, um, a, what can we, how can we ensure that all students are receiving and accessing all of the needs that they, that all the opportunities to be healthy and whole as a child and student. When we first uh, closed campuses um, in the spring, one of the first things that you saw was nutrition continuity, lunches and breakfast, grab and go, because we wanted to make sure all students could have access to meals. You also saw technology, devices being distributed, and connectivity being a big issue for equity, ensuring that all students could have access to, to school. Those are, those are still continuing, but I'll tell you the other big layer has to do with ensuring that students have access to social and emotional uh, supports. That is a huge factor. We saw entities like Calm addressing that from the get-go, and we still will need that. Um, and equity regarding ec uh, learning loss. A big concern had to do with closing campuses in the spring, um, but opening fall, opening school in the fall and closing campus in the spring are very different because in the spring, and I'll just say this very quickly, in spring, it was a pandemic uh, response. The governor said, you know what, we, we're, closing, we're closing campuses, we, um, grades don't have to be counted exactly as they were, et cetera. In the fall, when schools open, attendance is on, grades are on, credits are on, everything is back on, it's just in a completely different environment. So as we look through the equity lens, um, we're coming back to school with oftentimes hybrid models, everyone going through traumatic experiences of the pandemic, not just the students, but the staff included and the parents who are dropping off their students. And so when we're asking the question, how do we ensure all everyone will get access to all every opportunity? It's with um, all of this lens in mind and these models in mind. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with a, a final statement around uh, thoughts around what can anyone do or the community do or what can CALM do? Because I think it's such an important question in terms of where we are for reopening and this equity lens and the community. Um, the first one is something that you're already doing, those who are listening today. You're really in informing yourself, educating yourself around why are these models so different across um, the county across districts in the state. I think it's so important because when it opens and they're all, when schools open and they're different, it's so, I'm so grateful that you're here to hear why they're going to look so differently. So I appreciate that so much. The second piece I think is, is what we've all been doing already, which is to be very, very flexible. When schools open in their model that they're planning for, it could be a matter of days, weeks, or maybe months that that model shifts because of COVID-19. And so every well-laid plan could change because of the circumstances in the environment. And the third and the final thing, and before I pass it on to Fran or back to John actually, is to say that, you know, I reflected a lot about um, calm. I reflected about myself in all of this. As a mom of two, as John said, um, you know, I, I think about, am I doing enough for my family right now? Are, are my kids well? Are, is my family well? Of course, and we, I think we all think that about how are we doing and how, how well are we doing and how are they? How are we? I also reflected differently. This is for the first time at just a few days ago, really deeply thought about myself as young Susan, you know, growing up, uh, Susan. And I thought about how, you know, when we talk about, you know, how, are, how can individuals be well? Like, what does it mean to have a family or a, a kind of environment that ensures that you can go to school well? 
And I think about the security and the, the um, nurturing and the stability. And as I was thinking about kids, Susan, I realized that, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of that growing up as a child. I, it really was a, a challenge for me. And what helped me was going to school. I mean, what helped me were the relationships at school and the teachers that I had. And I know that students are like me now, but they have this huge other layer of going through a pandemic. They have fear, they have isolation, there's more acute, uh, acute uh, circumstances of abuse, we know, we know this. So my, my, my kid self, you know, thanks the calms and the community organizations that are helping because I think that um, all of that that's needed, that I needed, I found in schools. But what you're doing intentionally to reach into schools, to support teachers, to support the community is so needed that I just truly appreciate that because as we come back to schools and as we address loss of learning and as we address social and emotional needs, the work of CALM and those like CALM are ones that are really helping to change lives and save lives right now. We really, really appreciate it. So wanted to, let me pass that back to, to John and thank you. Thank you, Susan. Those were great opening remarks. Um, and what, what a great frame to frame it both as a professional, a mom and you know, your, your kid self. I think those are all really important lenses to keep in mind as we look at the issue because we're all you know, seeing it from different points of view. So our next speaker is Fran Wagonick, Dr. Fran Wagonick. We have two doctors, Elena's not a doctor, but the other two are, are, are doctors. Um, I, I feel like I've worked with Fran for decades now, but it's only been years. Uh, we've had a great partnership as a foundation and, and uh, someone working uh, in Santa Barbara Unified. Uh, Fran attended local public schools as did Susan, um, taught in many of them um, and got her PhD focusing on counselor Council Practice and Social Justice Advocacy. Um, Fran has been at Santa Barbara Unified for a long time now and now focusing on um, uh, Assistant and Superintendent of Student Services. I think she has a unique, that's my phone. Okay, never mind. She has a unique perspective on this issue given her focus on, uh, given her focus on the needs of students and supporting staff to support students. So I think she brings an important lens to this. And I, I will say that, that's my phone again, uh, that uh, Fran was my last pre-COVID work lunch. <laughs> and so we have a unique relationship as that was the last lunch I was able to have as a professional in person up until very, uh, very recently. I had a tuna melt. I don't remember, Fran, you remember what you had. I had a tuna melt. And I think we just learned Fran is a Giants fan. I think we just learned that just now, didn't we? There we go. All right, so we turn it over to Fran. Thank you. Thank you, John. Yes, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting back to those lunches and working with folks in, in, um, in person almost as much as I'm looking forward to baseball starting. Um, you know, I wanna start with, thank you for saying that, that the work that I do is, is you know, focused on students. Um, Sometimes in, in an adult dominated world, we, um, we lose sight of that. But I know that the people on the call today, um, Elena, Susan, and John, that you always have um, students at the forefront. And, and when we're doing this work, um, I, I think the big message that I wanna try to, to put out there to, to folks um, in our community is we really are thinking about everyone as we're planning. So as we're planning for the reopening of school, we are talking about parents and their needs. We're talking about students and their needs, and we're absolutely talking about our staff and what they need. And, and I know Elena and Susan's children, and I, so faces actually pop up for me um, when, we're, when we're doing that planning. These are real families with real needs. And so I appreciate um, thoroughly the 80 participants that we have on this call today for being here. 
Um, last night we had a seven hour board meeting and a large chunk of that uh, was, was devoted to our plan for reopening school. And um, as Susan was sharing, we're planning for a hybrid model because planning for a hybrid model allows us to pivot um, either to a full remote learning um, situation as we had in the spring or to a full reopening. But we, at Santa Barbara Unified will be one of those districts that is most likely to go into the hybrid model. Um, but we're giving ourselves a little more time uh, to see if something miraculous happens with this, um, with this virus. Um, and I was taking some notes when, when Susan was talking that, that I, um, that idea that no one knows what the answer is, is very important, but it really plays into what we're talking about today and that's mental health. Ambiguity, uh, living in the gray, in the gray zone, is very difficult for most people. And we, we have um, different levels of tolerance for that ambiguity. Um, and, and when I think about our students, um, depending on their age, even if, if the kids don't know about the ambiguity and the nebulousness of, of, of what August is going to look like in terms of reopening school, their parents do. And, and, and there is an osmosis of anxiety that um, <laughs> flows back and forth. And so we have that to consider. So speaking specifically to Santa Barbara Unified, and I appreciate being able to represent our district, knowing that there are so many other districts in our county that are experiencing the same things. But we really are, are working from a place of three guiding um, priorities during this time. And number one is safety, both physical and mental, emotional safety. And we have to plan for that. And um, that's going to be a tall order, but we are definitely doing that. And uh, learning is our, our second priority um, and providing that equity of opportunity that Susan talked about. Um, the pandemic really did um, sharpen and magnify the inequities that exist in our own community in terms of being able to handle the, all facets of the pandemic. Um, but in our case, um, access to educational opportunities. And then finally, our third guiding principle is listening, listening to all our stakeholders, um, uh, really at a granular level, listening to um, the teachers talk about their fears for returning and, and um, listening to parents say, my, my children are struggling mightily with, with the lack of social interaction that is so important to development of children and adolescents and, and listening to community, community members and their concerns about the economy. And Susan talked about childcare. Childcare is an economic um, necessity. Um, the, the health of our community depends on folks being able to be in, uh, be at work. And so all of these things um, come together to, to create um, anxiety for, for everyone involved. Um, so I'd like, you know, with all of that in mind, talking about mental wellness, it really is a key condition for learning, even in the best of times. We know the research shows that a, that a child that is struggling with um, uh, mental health issues or uh, emotional imbalance um, cannot learn. You come into the classroom and that is an absolute condition for learning. And so that's been, um, it's been fantastic to work with Calm to um, put, put programs in place to address that. And I'll talk more about what that looks like in a moment. But, um, you know, schools can have the best teachers and the best curriculum, but if children are struggling, um, learning is going to be um, limited at best. And that's, that's the big uh, concern going into August is that 
we can do planning around how instruction will look different. We can plan hybrid models. But if, um, but if students bring um, their um, anxiety to school, which they will, or their fears, um, then, then the learning has to take a back seat to making sure that they um, are well. And, you know, we, we receive criticisms about that um, regularly. And, and folks, um, uh, stakeholders, uh, express their opinion. Come on, Santa Barbara Unified. If you just teach children to read and write, everything would be fine. And I think that's a very limited and simplistic view of a, a complicated situation. Um, so, but, re but we have to have that in place. We have to have the wellness. And we look at um, the education of our students kind of as a, a triple Venn diagram of academics, um, behavior, and then social, emotional, or mental wellness. And we believe that we have to equitably address those three, those three areas. And that's where Calm really comes in for us, is helping um, our teachers um, understand that. Um, because in, in teacher preparation programs, um, until very recently, they don't, that's not what is covered. We don't, we don't have instruction in, you know, how to address um, behavioral dysregulation or how to teach social emotional learning or to understand what it is. And so Calm really fills that, that role and, and our ultimate goal is to have these um, trauma-informed schools um, where, where all teachers know how to see trauma in students and respond to behaviors. Um, so as we plan for the reopening, we already had um, the first of a number of conversations with Calm about what do we need to do differently um, this year in order to prepare for the opening of school and where we landed and, and we're at the point to, we're ready to have the, the next conversation is we have to make sure the adults are ready to return, um, both parents and teachers and other staff members are emotionally and mentally ready to return to school so that they can receive um, the students and provide them with the um, calming reassurances that they need as they come back. Um, so I think that um, probably the last point I wanted to make is that what makes um, working with Calm so important and so special for us over the last few years, and now we're heading into our third year, Elena, our third year, um, is that the mental health um, consultation model that they use, and I believe Elena will probably expand on this, um, really does build up that critical mass on a campus of um, teachers and other and administrators and other staff members who um, can respond to children's needs in the moment, rather than say, oh no, you're struggling, you're struggling. Okay, guess what, oh, you know what we're gonna do? A week from now, you're gonna see a therapist and. So it, it um, and while the teachers and other staff members certainly don't do the level of therapeutic um, care that some students need on an ongoing basis, they can really do a lot to um, provide a safe and nurturing um, classroom climate and school climate that makes children feel safe, which in, it in turn helps them um, be ready to learn. I mean, it's that simple. Um, and I know, you know, I appreciate that Susan shared um, her own um, experience as a child. I actually um, suffered from pretty crippling anxiety um, from about kindergarten into third grade. 
And um, I think about what it would have been like for me because I was a, um, I was a sharp kid. I, I could sense what was going on around me, even if I didn't understand the details. And I had things going on in my life with my family that um, were troubling. And if I had had, uh, if I had attended school in a, a trauma-informed school, I think it would have made a world of difference for me in, in being able to learn how to address and handle those anxieties. Um, and I had, you know, I was a kid who had all the, all my needs taken care of physically and um, had everything going for me and went to, um, you know, good school. But, um, and I struggled. So I wonder about students who don't have all the things that I had as a child um, and as a teenager too. That, that anxiety continued, but, um, but morphed and changed. Um, so I think about that and I think it's important for all of us to think about um, ourselves as children from time to time because, uh, because that allows us to be empathetic to what um, kids are experiencing. So, I think with that, I will uh, turn it back over to John. Thank you, thank you, Fran. Really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. What a what a great challenge you all have at the district. I know you have such, you know, you're focused on doing it right, doing it right for all your stakeholders and children. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So we're going to turn things over to Elena. Uh, Elena is the CEO of Calm. Uh, this screen here says you've been there since 2015. That it's not possible because you just started last year. I'm pretty sure of it. But uh, um, Elena is going to talk more about comms work in the schools. Um, so Elena, I'll just turn that over to you. And then in a few minutes, we'll be open for, for Q&A. So those of you on the webinar that have questions brewing, feel free to type them in and, and we'll get through as many as we can. So Elena. Thanks, John. I want to just, before I jump in, I. I just feel really honored to be part of this dream team of panelists. Uh, Susan, And since you've ascended into your role, I think that you have faced so many interesting and unique challenges that I don't think you could have ever imagined and you've handled them with such calm poise and a fierceness um, that I am so grateful for. And Fran, I just think I've known you for a very long time and you're a visionary leader, but at the heart of it, you have so much integrity and so much commitment to doing what is right. And so I have such a level of trust in being able to partner with you. And John, I've known you for a very long time too. And I think what I appreciate about you is that you always know how to ask the right questions. Um, you may not have all the, the right answers or may not even know the answers, but you are brave to ask the right and the good questions. Um, we'll see how you do in Q&A here, maybe. We'll see. But um, I just think that all of those skills and all of those qualities of fierceness, of an integrity and asking the right questions are going to be needed <laughs> as we weather this transition right now. So but as you've all said, I think mental health is always a priority, always needs to be a priority. Wellness is the foundation of learning, as Fran said, but I think as we're weathering what we're currently going through, mental wellness is an imperative or we're not going to make it through this. So just to set the context, I think all of you have commented <clears throat> on this, but obviously Calm's role for 50 years has been focused on childhood trauma and interpersonal trauma. In our communities, we've added to that lens some regional trauma with uh, fires and debris flows, which really, I think, grew the understanding of what trauma is in our county. Now we're all experiencing a global health pandemic. And in recent weeks, we've been reminded of uh, the longstanding generational and historical trauma of racism and the plague that that is in our communities. And so all of us are experiencing trauma. It can no longer be said that trauma is happening in those families, on those sides of the tracks, over in that town over there. Trauma is here, like it's always been here, but I think for the first time we're recognizing how pervasive it is. And 
as you've mentioned, what's going to happen in the fall is not just that we're, we're helping one or two children who are experiencing trauma or one or two teachers who may have a traumatic background. All of us are coming back to school with trauma as parents, as students, as teachers, as administrators. And we're swimming in a stew of trauma, the rising anxiety levels, depression levels, um, suicide attempts are going up, especially amongst teenagers, but we know that we've had attempts as early as third and fourth grade. Um, my counselor and our therapists at Calm have worked with those students pre-pandemic, so we know that that's going to be bubbling up. We also know from shelter in place while we're trying to address this public health crisis, of the pandemic, we're also sitting in a public health crisis of racism. We're also sitting in a public health crisis of abuse that's happening behind closed doors. And all of these children that haven't been seen by a professional in years are going to be coming back to school with folks that are also muddling through at the best that they can. So there's, there's just a lot of stressors. And one factoid that I learned from one of my colleagues at Calm is that there's been some research done in the past of students who had been quarantined, not for something as pervasive as a global pandemic, but students who had ex gone through quarantine when they came back to school, they had four times the level of PTSD as their counterparts who had not been quarantined. Now every student has been quarantined. Every student is going to have four times the rate of PTSD than the student population before this experience. So all of that to say, not to be doom and gloom, but just that there are really, really large needs facing all of us as we come back to whatever school looks like in the fall. So as Fran mentioned, I do wanna share a little bit about the model that Calm has been using both within Santa Barbara Unified and two other districts, Goleta Union and Orchid in our county, and also 31 learning centers, preschool and after school learning centers. And it's a model called mental health consultation. And it's a unique approach because it focuses on supporting the adults who support the children, who support the students. It's really building the adult capacity, as Fran was saying, to build a trauma-informed or a trauma-responsive school. Of course, the child always is the North Star, but the approach really looks at every stakeholder. So it's supporting the teacher, it's supporting the parent, it's supporting the school counselor, the school administrator, the yard duty staff, every single person that interacts with the student has a role in the focus of mental health consultation. Um, and it's really focusing on the safety of the school community. And it's a tailored approach. So every school gets a slightly different model based on its needs in every district. What we did for Santa Barbara Unified was different from what we did for Goleta Union, which was different from what we did in Orchid, because every district, every school, and really every classroom has a different culture and has a different set of students and a different set of needs. So it's a very uh, tailored approach to the mental health needs. And rather than a traditional mental health model where it's a pull out model, so there's an identified student who might be experiencing trauma and you pull them out and go fix them for an hour over there and then you put them back. It's a push in model where, uh, again, we're trying to build a trauma informed classroom and helping that teacher, again, helping that adult to really figure out how they can enhance the system of their classroom for all students. And, and again, right now, this model is going to be very important because all of us are going to be traumatized. There's no pulling out individuals. We're, we could all be pulled out based on the trauma levels. So it's the push in model is going to be very important. Um, and the final part of this that I think um, hopefully we'll get some time to talk about a bit more in Q&A, but is reflective practice, which is a component of really creating space and time for the adults to process the process of teaching and the, the, the experience of teaching and creating space for them to talk about what worked well, what blew up in their faces, and what they learn from it and what they're going to try differently and really 
keeping a creative and curious mindset about that to always improve and always respond to the needs of the children um, and not see anything as a failing, just seeing it as continued learning to do better. And I think that mindset, that kind of a growth mindset is going to be absolutely critical, as Fran said, when we're just knee deep in ambiguity, we're going to have the best laid plans and they're probably not going to work. And we're going to have to adjust course day by day, student by student. And so this idea of incorporating reflective practice in for the leaders is in my mind, critical at all times, but again, an imperative right now as we face the results of this pandemic. Um, so I'll just really, I'll, I'll end there just to say that I think CALM is poised to continue to build on these partnerships. I think we about 10 years ago decided to make a very conscious decision that we would always provide mental health support, supports to individual children or individual families that came to our clinics or now are being served through telehealth. But if we wanna move the needle on an issue as complex as childhood trauma and now global trauma, uh, we have to work at the system level. So I'm, I'm so pleased that we had the foresight to work with Fran now for three years um, in Santa Barbara Unified to have staff fully embedded, to have our therapists embedded with teachers in classrooms where they're part of the school community. So they're working at that system level. I think those relationships made all the difference on Friday the 13th of March when everything shut down and we went virtual and we were able to pivot so quickly to continue to meet the needs of those teachers because we were already embedded and that system level connectivity is is going to be critical moving forward so i'll pause there and open it up thank you well thanks to all three of you for really thoughtful presentations we've got another 17 18 minutes to talk together and be together so if folks on the call want to send in some questions, please feel free and we'll get to those as best as possible. Um, I'm going to use moderator's privilege to ask, ask one that's like been on my mind and, and, and the end of which is self-serving. And it's a three-part question and you can ignore the first two parts if you want because it's really just rhetorical. But, but uh, you know, our foundation has been a supporter of CALM and the mental health consultation model for a while, starting at Storyteller years ago. But it's not the only group that we support that partners with the school districts around mental wellness and social emotional well-being. And I was looking at our list and we have, depending on how you look at it, at least six groups that we fund that work directly with Santa Barbara Unified on mental health issues. And then if you expand that a little bit to look at other districts or preschool, it goes to about 10. And I was looking at that and like, I was a little shocked and, and thinking back, you know, to my childhood, since we were doing that, like I was an inattentive young man and my head was under the water a lot, but it was like, was this happening when I was in school? Like, what is going on that this is sort of a major focus? So that's question, if you want to answer it, what's going on? How did the schools become, you know, the reading, writing and arithmetic schools become the focal point of mental health access for students and families. Like, when did that happen? You know, Fran, you all are educators. You guys are all educators and now, but no, that's not enough. It, you know, we're asking you to take care of the whole child. And, and, and so when did that happen? And I think most importantly, um, how, what, what are things that we as community investors should look, look at to say like, well, how is all this gonna work? And then if we're looking at programs, because we and others get approached, what should we look at in a program to say, you know, that one is effective. That's what the school needs as opposed to, as opposed to not. So really focusing on, you can, you can address any of those, but what do we need to do to, to a latest point to make this work as a system? And what should we be looking at in nonprofits that partner with school districts to know like that's the one to support? Swing that open. That was, that was huge. <laughs> that was a big question. I think I'll take my stab first. Um, what should you be looking for? Uh, you know, 
we actually, um, over the last five years, have, have pared down our partnerships. Um, we had, we had um, random acts of mental health services, and there was really a concerted effort. Um, in 2016-17, we saw the need with a, a huge uptick in suicide attempts amongst our adolescents uh, to say, what are we doing and what works and what doesn't work? And so for me, there, there are two major prerequisites for the organizations that we work with. The first is, um, are they good partners? Because it's a relationship. And just like any relationship, you have to tend to it and you have to work through things and and you need to like each other and so that is huge the second one is do they do they have the ability does that organization have the ability to evaluate its work and improve its practices based on that so those are the two main things that we're looking for in santa barbara unified that have really changed what we're doing and um, that's why Calm um, is our partner for preschool through grade six because they they meet those those um, requirements. I'm going to jump in, and John, there were like 20 questions, so I think I'm going to get to <laughs> point five of some of them. I will see how I can do here. I mean, maybe the others should be handled over lunch, but anyway. right. That was great. Well, I, I just wanted, yeah, I wanted to say a couple of things. One is um, something that has been coming up in, in a, as a theme um, when I speak with district leaders and we're working with, you know, when I, I'm in Santa Maria or in Lompoc or any community. One of the things that have come up more and more and more recently in the last few years is under the umbrella of coherence. You know, there are, we are so rich with, so fortunate with rich with um, entities that want to support kind of goes with what Fran was saying years ago um, when you when you would ask the question what are the supports that you have someone could pull out a sheet of all of these programs push in pull out da, 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 you know all these things and now what what we're working on is having many of those programs are very helpful but how what is coherent about it what threads them together and how do they address the needs we know we have within our community? And if, if they're outside of that, and if it isn't coherent, what I am hearing actually is school districts saying things like this. Um, even if an, an entity, XYZ entity, were going to say, I'll give this to you, it's worth $100,000 and I'll give it to you for free to get into your district. What I'm hearing districts saying is, Thank you, but it's not aligned or coherent with our plan. And we need to really focus on what it is we need to focus. So what I'm not saying is, I'm not saying that um, entities aren't needed. I'm not saying that organizations aren't needed. What I'm saying is that it really is now at a place of, we've got some significant needs. We're very aware that it isn't isolated academic only. It isn't food continuity only. It's not social emotional needs only. It is a, it's a full picture. And so given our picture, how do the entities fit together in a coherent way to support this? And so they're threaded together and woven. In some cases, there are fewer. In some cases, they're the same, but kind of organized differently. And in other cases, different entities are the ones that are asked to support. So that, that's our response to some of the questions, John, that you, that you asked. Great, thank you very much for that. So taking one question uh, from our listeners, and I think this is gonna be between Susan and Elena. Um, we're, we're talking with Fran here from Santa Barbara Unified, one of our larger districts that has a, a, you know, a comprehensive look about these mental health issues. I, and you, Susan, deal with a lot of smaller rural districts um, that have kids with the same issues. So how does this manifest and how, do, how, does, how does that happen in, in very small rural districts? And then Elena, if you wanna pick up on that. So, so Susan. Yeah, I, you know, thanks for that question. It's a really great question. And I'd say that the most remote 
and the most rural for Santa Barbara County is Cuyama. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna put that here for a moment and then I'm gonna talk about some of the others just because um, when I think about all of our districts in the county and I think about Guadalupe, for example, it's very, very West, the most West. Guadalupe is um, doing incredible work um, at Dr. Emilio Handel with his team and community partners, many of whom probably are online and that, that you know, are really focusing in on Guadalupe, which is wonderful. Plus, it's part of a North County region, Santa Maria, Orchid. So they kind of have partners. Lompoc has, you know, so they're San, the San Inez Valley. Um, even though they're rural, they have partners together. So they're working together. Carpinteria, the most South, not rural, but they're also very, very, um, they're looking as a community, how can we ensure that we have supports for our community? And they look both North to Santa Barbara and South to Ventura. So that's why I think about the most isolated district and most rural is Cuyama. And they absolutely have to full acknowledgement that they have studied and, and need mental wellness supports in Cuyama. It is so challenging. For, um, for us, them, anyone to support Cuyama because, and I think it has to do with the fact that to get there, you're driving in, you know, about an hour, 20 minutes just to go and come back. I think it's, I think it's that isolated um, issue if you're driving in from Santa Maria, that is. And so um, there has been a lot of efforts to support Cuyama. Um, and it is, it's not, we're not there yet. They, they, we, we know it's needed. There are many, many um, suicide attempts. There are needs for social, emotional, and mental support. Um, and it, they don't have what they need yet. Um, and there's a new superintendent there. They, they have, one of the issues too, is that there's a lot of rotating um, staff because of housing issues and experience issues. But there's a new superintendent there, Alfonso Gamino really, um, he is the kind of leader you want in Cuyama. And I really am very, very hopeful that, that with, through partnerships, um, we can continue to address the needs. But thank you for addressing it. I'm, I'm saying that it's not solved yet. And I really acknowledge that there's a gap, gap there. I, I would just quickly add um, that from a mental health perspective, what I think about is just the isolation um, and during this pandemic, of course, all of us are struggling with sense of, you know, John, I hear from you, we need to get a business lunch. Uh, you're struggling with isolation too. We all are. Um, and so in those rural communities where there are fewer resources and fewer places and points of connectivity, I worry about the sense of isolation just being you know, I guess in those communities, perhaps they don't know any other because that's that's the context in which they're they're used to. But I think the the compounding isolation of this pandemic, along with fear and anxiety, is just going to exacerbate some of those pre-existing concerns. I think a silver lining, perhaps, um, is that telehealth has become a part of mental health service delivery, and so. Some of the drive time, um, I, I think, you know, as calm as is planning on how we're going to slowly reopen to some face-to-face -face contact for clients, um, because there are some clients that really need that. They're going to need that. We're trying to figure out safe ways to do that for clients and for staff, but telehealth is going to be with us forever. So for those rural and remote areas, it may actually be a silver lining in this that we've been able to, for families that have access to technology, because that continues to be an equity issue, but for families that have it, a, a way that we might be able to reach more families and provide more connection, which could be a, a blessing going forward. Thank you. So maybe just spin off of that and then, uh... And then probably one sort of, Elena wanted a hopeful closing question, so I don't know if I can come up with one, but uh, we'll try for that. But you're talking about technology and, and clearly uh, it's, it's, there's a massive change in how that's used and students are using technology sort of all the time for learning. So do you see any particular mental health concerns or issues coming from the fact that that is is a lot of a, a student's learning experience now and, and is going to be in the future? Are there some of these issues related to just that technology interface that's now essential? Uh, 
Anyone? No concerns around that? <laughs> Do you want to start, Fran? I have concerns, but it's mostly as a mom, but. <laughs> Well, and, and John, I wanted to clarify, do you mean um, in terms of the the telehealth or just being online in general so I much? Think, I think it's being online in general and now for this, you know, this purpose of learning that was really has, was such a human interface for so much, so much time of the kid's life is now replaced by, you know, a, a screen. And so that's just a, another shift. Well, and what I, th I think my number one concern is that we need the, the time. I don't think we're ever going to go back to pre-pandemic, here's what school looked like, brick and mortar, come sit in the room. Exactly. I mean, I think good things are coming out of this crisis in terms of how we can use technology, but we can't take the brick and mortar classroom and that doesn't translate to this sort of setting. We have to do things differently. And so really what we need is, is the time and energy to um, really help teachers, uh, provide professional learning to teachers to be able to, um, to educate students appropriately using online. Um, I think we are going to, the future of education is a blended learning model um, along a spectrum. So um, I am concerned if students have, I'm concerned for students who are receiving education um, that keeps the old model in mind and trying to deliver it like this. I'm also concerned about adults who spend seven and eight hours a day on Zoom. Yeah, I'm speaking for myself. I, I feel it, it's real. Um, so there's that to consider as well. And that's what I, I was going, I, two things and they may be conflicting ideas, but as a parent, I'm trying to have some grace with myself and some, you know, I have two rising fifth graders in the back on their tablets right now because mama's on this and I just have to be okay with that and give myself grace and permission that it's, you know, screens aren't evil um, if they're used in moderation and to your point, Fran, on a continuum. And we're all gonna have to learn how we do that because, you know, Susan, you said in your opening, you know, am I doing enough? And as parents, we have to fill up our own wells. You know, I am a working mom, I have a big job, but I have two 10 year old daughters that I care and love deeply for. And I have to do enough for myself so that I can do for them. And so some, there's going to be as a parent, a part of screen that just enables me to live my life. Um, and then the other thing I would say to your point, Fran, is Zoom fatigue is a real thing. And doing trauma work, our clinicians at Calm have really hard jobs as it is. Doing trauma work for seven, eight hours in a row on screens is devastatingly hard. And so I worry about the toll that some of this, again, on the adults, the adults that care for the kids, we have to be keeping our minds focused on their wellness. We have to put those oxygen masks on as parents, as teachers, as Calm clinicians, as anyone because if we burn out, we're gonna have nothing left to give the kiddos. And so I think we all have to be really attending to these really serious needs. Great, so we are, we are nearing the end of our hour. Um, so thank you for our three leaders for speaking with us for this time. And, and uh, you are surrounded by a virtual community of now 76 participants, which is pretty good. <laughs> that people stayed with us um, that want to support you. So if you have like a, a, just a little close of what can this community do to support each of you and your positions in the months ahead? Well, John, I, I, I don't want to forget um, to talk about the, the dogs that I have. I just don't want to. <laughs> and no one got that right. <laughs> 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 so um, I'll start there. We have two two labs, um, but actually, and more seriously, John, um, thanks so much for the opportunity for a closing comment, and really want to thank everyone again for your um, time and attention and focus and energy. This has been 
I, I talk a lot about energy management in terms of leadership in our organization. And I mean, we are, we are going ultra marathon from now for many, many months here. So really appreciate everyone's energy and focus on this. Thank you to Calm. Really appreciate this important work that you're doing for children. Um, and, um, and Fran, thank you so much for the incredible support at Santa Barbara Unified. It's our second largest district in Santa Barbara County. It's a, a huge driver and really appreciate that. And John, thank you so much for all of your support, the, moderate, the moderating today, but beyond that, the, the real community support that you and the foundation provides. And as we go forward, I, I just wanna say thank you again, everyone for your flexibility, your understanding. Our teachers, our staff have been, everyone's teachers and staff in the districts have been putting so much in, first to pivot to distance learning and now to reimagine what school will look like. We, we definitely need your continued support of our uh, teachers who are doing such incredible work and support for, for youth and families, to our parents who are all wondering, am I doing enough? And can I, how can I do more? And to our children um, and youth and teens who are really um, wanting to have that interaction with one another. Um, so I think it's going to be a lot of, again, that energy and support back to our community as we reopen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Fran. How about you? What are your one or two words? Um, for me, it really, um, I, I've been reflecting lately on the fact that Santa Barbara is a community of, of givers and problem solvers. And if this isn't the biggest problem we've ever had to solve, the, the pandemic and the public health crisis uh, around racism, I don't know what is. And, and I'm highly confident that we will come together and solve these issues. Um, and so I guess my ask would be, um, my ask would be to ask if you have questions and, and you have wonderings, um, please reach out and to, to any or all of us um, regarding your questions. We want to work with you uh, to solve the problem. So thank you for being here. Great. And Elena, what can we do to support you? And that will close us out. Well, I'm gonna do what I said I didn't want to do and end on a bummer note potentially, but I, I just wanna share with those that are still listening in that we know from disaster response research that when there's a, a major regional disaster, and I think a global disaster counts as this, that the mental wellness bottom falls out about nine months post. So I just want to say to Susan's point of this being a marathon, it's absolutely a marathon because we're dealing with virus transmission and we have no way of knowing how this is all going to play out. But if we look at it from a mental health marathon, knowing that if, if, the, if the beginning of this crisis was March, nine months out is December. And um, when holidays likely will look different, for us when we will be in the midst of winter months and virus transmissions might be spiking. Um, that's when folks coping, the, the unhealthy potentially coping mechanisms that they've been using, or they're gonna reach their limits. And I think we as a community are gonna be dealing with a new level of uh, crisis and emergency in this changing and evolving scene. So I guess what, I would ask for is that folks really think about the long-term ramifications of all of this for our children and for our families. We're gonna be in this for the long haul. I think with some very significant investments needing to happen in this school year and the following one, because I think if it's true that in December, January, we're reaching um, perhaps a second wave or a new spike in virus transmission at the same exact time as the mental health crisis spiking, um, we need to know that there's uh, support for these efforts going forward. Um, and then I would just say, um, for, on behalf of Susan and myself, <laughs> reach out to your working parents uh, in your life. Make sure you're checking on them. They are holding a lot. We don't know what school is going to look like. We don't know what this hybrid model is going to mean for us. Keep checking in on us. Bring me dinner. I want dinner. Oh. Um, but just seriously, um, 
take care of each other, be kind to one another, this is really hard. So um, we have to stick together as a community and really uh, keep, keep the long-term goal in mind. Great. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for uh, the three leaders here and all of you that were on this webinar call. And I think we will wish you a good late morning and sign off. Bye.